Open your Bibles to 1 Kings. Do one more study out of 1 Kings 18, out of the 18th chapter. Last verse. Well, it was the last verse we had last time. Verse 40. We talked about how he won and lost the Reformation in the same day last week. Today we're going to look at the subject matter out of verse 40, misguided zeal, misguided zeal and misguided authority. Uh, for what, for what, what Elijah did here just killed the Reformation. Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal, that's after they won the contest, do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. We talked about that idea last week. We're going to continue that uh, today. For those from the Internet, we want to welcome you to the 930 Sunday assembly session of Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. We still haven't met on Wednesday. I don't know when we'll get to do that. Maybe with the COVID going down, uh, but it's liable to go back up because we're setting in November, September, October, November, flu season. Who, who knows how we'll deal with that. So, but we are assembling on Sunday for one hour and we're in the, the series entitled The Life of Elijah. We're talking about verse 40 today. And uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into our morning study. Misguided zeal and misguided authority. Uh, when we have prayer, we don't know really what's going on, but there has been an emergency call from the Billy Smith family. That's the family that usually sits on the front row here. Uh, somebody's gone to the hospital. Uh, they called Jackie, and Jackie's dealing with him now somewhere. And so um, let's build, pray for the Billy, Moore, the Billy um, Smith family, okay? Let's have prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. The evidence of carnality is personal sin. How do we get out of carnality back into the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit called spirituality? We confess our sin. 1 John 1, 9, I like it because of the word cleansing. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to uh, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The word cleansing takes us back to the cross in the Christian life. What do we do with personal sin in our life? We confess it. We name it, cite it, homo legeo. Because the Bible declares to us what sin is, and we know sin can have no place in the productive Christian life. It has to be removed. How is it removed? Confession. When you confess it, he forgives, he cleanses, and restores you to spirituality. I give you a moment for that. Mental attitude, sin, sense of the tongue, or avert sin should be considered among many, but certainly those three categories. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your love, mercy, and grace. We pray, Father, today for the Billy Smith family, not knowing exactly what's going on, but we know there's, a, there's problems. And so we lift that family before you, Father, and pray uh, clarity uh, for our continued prayer for the family. And pray for the medical staff that will treat them at the hospital. And uh, we can only lift that family before you, Father, and pray for whatever's going on in their life, that they will be champions for Christ. Uh, we pray today, Father, for our nation. November, we go into a probably maybe the most critical election in probably 40, 50 years. 
for the status of our nation in the divine viewpoint. So I lift them before you, Father, all the way down from the national level to the state level to the community level to our own. Those, all those in authority. May they have the wisdom of divine institutional thinking and bring God as the center player to all their decision making that would be beneficial to the people. Everybody keeps calling us a democracy. It would be good if we could read history and understand, Father, the difference in that in a an election republic. I pray today, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister once again the truth of the Word of God to our souls, not only in learning but in living. We not may, may not make the mistakes that Elijah made in a key, important place in our life. And who knows which one's important? They're all important. When the perfect timing of God matches the doctrine in our soul to the situation we're in, in our life, it's a dramatic moment. I pray that for, upon our, our congregation and especially the Billy Smith family. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just going back to take a look. We're currently studying the first phase of the life of Elijah. This is the period of King Ahab's reign and his ministry to that. Uh, I covered that because it's very similar. They were in a drought to bring a spiritual awakening, to bring a spiritual reformation. Some real changes. Uh, a new normal, as they say today. I want new, I don't want normal. You know, a reformation is not a new normal. It is new, though. Uh, it, and, and truthfully, it's not really new. It's taking you back to where you erred in, in your life as a nation to bring you back to some kind of truth. And truth, you know, the truth when it works for your nation is divine institutional. It's, so, it's the common sense of the average person. You don't have to be born again to understand the importance of divine institutions. They're for all people. They're for the church. They're for the unbeliever. They're for the believer. And they're common sense. I mean, the Word of God just declares it. We've, and you can tell when you're, when you're strayed away from, quote, divine institutional thinking or common sense on the street. I mean, we're so far down the pike. We've attacked freedom. We've attacked employment. We've attacked the family, marriage, the, the national structure. We're in a mess. And we've been in a mess a long time, and we know it. We, it's been many years ago that we started talking about the decay of the family, the decay of marriage and the family. That's the whole social foundational structure for a good nation. Well, anyhow, so we're, we're, we're looking at this. There. King Ahab married Jezebel out of the Sidonians. Her father was a king priest. And uh, she brought the apostate religion of idolatry, it's Baal, Baal worship, which is failing cult, which is part of the Canaanite. The Canaanites were the original. They just, they just took it to a high level. See, what, what the Phoenicians did, the Sidonian, the Phoenicians, they, they took the failing cult of the Canaanites and made a religion out of it. They put structure to it. They just, they just took structure. They left it in and took structure, and they got, you know, well, this, is, this is religion. So by the time we get to Jezebel, the Fali cult is a sociably, culturally accepted religion that's apostate from the word go. I mean, these people originally, they would have worshipped frogs and tadpoles and... Well, anyhow, so 
Israel comes in and offers them a whole new way of life through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, so here we have Israel has established that the, 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 there has been a split in the nations. The 12 tribes become 10 tribes called the North Kingdom. Two have become the South Kingdom. And the Northern Kingdom, under Jeroboam, their original founder of that, uh, was an idolater. Now, there's a lot of difference, does it? Abraham, Abraham came out of an idolatrous culture. What, what caused the change in his life? Gospel of Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.8. He believed that one day Jesus would come, called Christ, would die on a cross, be buried and raised from the dead. Galatians 3.8. How did Abraham get saved? Prophetic gospel. And it changed his life. This is a part of the biblical history that Elijah's forgotten about. When he says, go murder all these people. Abraham, in the Old Covenant, when somebody died, they went to Abraham's bosom. Remember that? <laughs> Wouldn't have been terrible if we'd got a hold of him and just killed him. Hmm. Uh. Yeah, something to think about. That's the kind of stuff I think about. Well, this drought, which God sent to bring a spiritual awakening, to bring a spirit. Listen, this is so apropos to America today. This virus is a spiritual awakening to bring a spiritual rhythm, to bring the people of God back. We, listen, we've got a whole culture of young people who know nothing about the true founding of our nation. I don't know a thing. We, you, you send them to school, spend all your money, and they become dumber if you've never done anything, never opened a book. They could have went out and sat outside and studied the birds and got more sense. My, 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 I tell you. <laughs> Throw that degree away. So this period of the drought is three and a half years. Now the three and a half years is over, and now God says, let's check and see if we had a spiritual awakening. And so we have a contest, 850 prophets of Baal against one prophet of Israel, the Lord Baal against the Lord God of Israel. Well, this should be no contest at all, right? And it wasn't. <laughs> and it wasn't. And, and the whole contest was winner take all, Right? Winner take all. Now, for the believer side, a guy like Elijah, uh, that's taking candy from a baby. That's David and Goliath. But the people of Israel, well, that's a whole different story, isn't it? Well, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, they had the contest. God wanted three men... He needed three men to do the Reformation. Elijah, he had him. Obadiah, he had him. Now he needed King Ahab. The king had to be part of it to, for the judicial authority. And he got him. He got him with, let's do a contest, winner take all. You bring the prophets. You bring the 850, and I'll bring the one. And that was a no contest. <laughs> From morning evening to the from morning sacrifice to the evening sacrifice, they hooped and hollered, danced. They bled their blood all over the altar to try to show Baal that they were serious about this. Nothing. Bible says no answer from Baal. Elijah comes along, builds an altar out of twelve stones, not ten. Builds a trench around, puts the dirt up, you know, digs out a trench around the altar. He makes the people participate with the stones and the, the whole participation of the burnt offering. He gets the whole people involved in it. They pour the water in there and he prays a simple prayer, not from morning to evening 
wallowing and hollering and whining and crying. Listen, you don't have to do that stuff if you have confidence in the Word of God. You don't have to sit around and moan and groan and think that somehow that's going to impress God. That just shows a lack of faith. Step up the plate. You answer your prayer according to the will of God. You pray your prayer according to the will of God. He hears it. Boom. You can be confident that he will do it. Now, he'll do it in his time, and he'll do it in his way. But he will do it. You don't have to sit around and moan and groan and cut yourself and tell God that, you know, you'll, uh, you'll do this if he'll do that. <laughs> That's not doing the will of God. Doing the will of God is believing he'll do what he told you he would do. The church is such a moaner and groaner today. Least little heat. And we waller and we swaller and waller and all that stuff. Listen. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, and then it's, it's, it's required for you to walk that faith out to the end. I don't care what he, where he tells you to walk, and I don't care he tell you how deep he tells you to walk in it. It's your responsibility to walk it out. You walk by faith and not by sight. You never need sight for faith to work. Don't make God put you through three and a half years of life, death, life situations for you to believe that God is capable of doing everything he says, Romans 4.21. Because he'll bring it upon your life and you'll need every bit of it. You'll need every bit of it. And you'll need every bit of it every day, all 24 hours of it. See, that's what this virus has, that virus has done. It says... It's a 24-7 day, or isn't it? The only break you get is in God. You don't get none from the virus. He's going to keep your nose to the grindstone. I call it a he, it could be a she. I don't know how viruses go. Doesn't really matter, does it? Doesn't matter to me, does it? I call it an it. Well, they have a great victory on Mount Carmel, you know, home field advantage to the, to the prophets of Baal. In our last study, we learned that God selected the three men. They all were in agreement. These three men came to an agreement on a contest to be held on Mount Carmel. Winner take all. Winner take all. Was based on the God of Baal versus the God of Israel. They ones with a little G and ones with a big G. Always put your faith in the big G. And it was which God can send fire under the altar to create a burnt offering. Well, only the Lord God of Israel did it. And he did it at amazing speed and wonder. 1 Kings 18 verses 30 through 40. What a wonderful read that whole section is. The Bible says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering. It consumed the wood, the twelve stones, the dirt of the trenches, and licked up the water that was in the trench. That's pretty good. That's, that's about it. I mean, that's a, a clean sweep. And I've gotten so hungry to watch some good football. I watched football last night till about 1030. A high school football game. So hungry to see some sports that I haven't seen that aren't 100 years old. And uh, that's quite a ball game, offensively. The Lord God of Israel won a spectacular victory that no one could dispute. It wasn't even close. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't even close. Elijah won it by the work of God's amazing grace through faith, like you do. 
then lost it in the same moment by works of the flesh through old man cosmos diabolical thinking. Think about that. God won this victorious win for him. It was all about which God. It wasn't about which prophet. It was about which God. And God proved himself. He, did, he, he showed himself out, is what you might say. He really showed himself out. Not even close. Then Elijah, Elijah won, lost that contest that same day. This lesson is part one, and we're going to look at four aspects. If Elijah's misguided zeal and authority recorded in 1 Kings 18.40. I don't want us to be in the midst of a win and a loss on the same, in the same day. You could very well be in a great win that is indisputable, the amazing grace of God at work, and then turn around, go into the flesh, old man, cosmos, diabolical thing, and lose it. I see it happen a lot. Then Elijah said to them, the Israelites, seize the prophets of Baal, do not let one of them escape. So they seized him, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew him. Actually, that's, a, that's an easy word for murder. In this one act, Elijah killed the spiritual reformation and the hope of reuniting the priest nation of Israel under one banner. Within 150 years of this event, these ten tribes will disappear from biblical history until the coming of Christ, second coming of Christ. Just think about that. Think the lost, the loss that happened that day in that moment. My, my. So here's point number one. Elijah might have thought Ahab was such a weak king. Now you say to me, you say to yourself like me, why would Elijah do that? This was such an outstanding work of God. I mean, Elijah's prayer is just, and it's gone, right? Two little verses is his prayer. He just, he did business. He went and stated the will of God, put it up to God, and God did it. It, it wasn't, it, he wasn't, he wasn't there all day and all night praying to God. He just stated the will of God back to God. He was done, prayed it, closed it, and there it was. See, that's, that's 1 John 5, 14 and 15. That's your prayer life, people. Let that, listen, you pray according to the will of God. He hears. When he hears, he does. That's Romans 4, 21. Put those verses together. You're smart enough to do that. You've got enough spiritual growth to do that. Listen, but it hardly ever comes at a time when things are going really easy. No, you have to pull those verses together when there's a tornado going through your house. That's because you're spiritually mature. Yes, anybody could do it when things are really going good, but a spiritual mature people, they can think on their feet when their feet are flying all over in the air when a tornado's got them going up and down and possibly out of the house. That's when you've got to have the Word of God in confidence. That's called stress. You think you're going to get out of here? Listen, the devil is going to put stress. Listen, in this world, you will have what? Tribulation. But be of good courage. Why? Christ has overcome it. Do you think you're going to have a day without tribulation? You don't want a day without tribulation. It, a day without tribulation means you're asleep. Which you ought to be thankful for. Elijah might have thought that Ahab was such a weak king that he would not go against Jezebel to rid the nation of Baal worship. I'm just thinking out loud. Because when Je Jezebel gets in this picture, she scares even Ahab. He wasn't afraid of 850 prophets, but he's afraid of one little skirt. 
How'd that happen? Wow. I had a professor one time said he was probably married. Elijah was probably not. That's how, you, that's how you become aware of the danger of a skirt. Well, Elijah might have thought, I mean, we would all think that. Well, if, I don't know if this boy, old boy will go against Jezebel. I don't know if he'll go against Jezebel. I don't know what he thought, but I know he didn't, he didn't go the right He didn't go with God. It's, but listen, it's not up to Elijah to play God or king any more than it was Jezebel. It wasn't any more his right to play God or king than it was for Jezebel. The difference, Jezebel is not a believer, and Elijah is. It was a matter, once the contest was won, it became a matter between King Ahab and God who establishes all government of the earth for his purpose and plan. You must think about that. All governments. When you look around, uh, when you look around the world today, you got all kinds of governments, don't you? Right? Not one of them have been established without God's write-off, unless he signs off on it. Just think about that. And, well, then you ought to go back and study a little bit. Where does nation come into existence? Genesis 10 and 11. What are the passages you should read about the government and God's role with the government? Romans 13, 1 Peter 2, uh, 1, uh, 1 Timothy 2. I put them on your paper, Romans 13, 1 through 7, 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17, 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 7. You should read these. I mean, you're, you're, we're coming to a very important election. I mean, a really important election. I mean, the kind of election that's going to change the government of America. Either we'll keep the government that we had and be strong to bring it back to the foundational ideas of our Constitution, which is a marvelous idea, or we're going to have a government from the pit of hell. And we're going to deserve what he gives us. And you, then you will learn to walk by faith. When you don't have the opportunity to go to the ballot box ever again, it will never be for the people, of the people, by the people. That day will be gone. And you don't realize how close we are to that. Do you realize that? I think, uh, hopefully this church does. We're there. I mean, the platforms are going to be very clear where they're going to take you. There's no, no matter, listen. Listen to Romans 13.1. Every person, how many? How many persons? Are you old enough to vote? Are you registered? Then vote. I recommend you go to the polls, not to the mail. If you have as much trouble with the mail that I have, I'm, I tell you, there's not a week go by. I don't, I don't put the mail back in and say you got the wrong address. Every person is to be in subjection, watch this now, to the governing authority. Don't tell you what kind of governing authority. Listen, Israel is, is going to go under so many different authorities. They're, they're going to they're gonna go under Babylon. They're going to go under Persia. They're going to, they're going to go under Greece, Greeks. They're going to go under the Romans. And then 
look at, and then who knows what after that, right? Except the historians who, who track it. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authority. When this, when this group goes in, they go in, they're going to, they're, they're, they will, listen, why do you think they're attacking the monuments of our founding? Listen, this is so Marxist. That's what they do. Religion and Marxism, that's what they do. They both do it. First thing they do is destroy everything. Listen, you, you, you have to, they're at war. They're at war with the church. They're at war, Christians, they're at war with Israel. Listen, gosh, I don't see how you can miss all this stuff. I, I'm sure you don't. But listen, when that day comes and they win that election, here you are, here you are. Every person is to be subject to what? The governing authority. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Elijah had done his job when he removed, when he, to move the Israelites from a spiritual awakening to a spiritual reformation as a prophet of the divine agency, the custodians of the word of God and evangelism. That's his job, and when he got it done, now he go back to preaching, teaching the word of God. But he didn't do that. It was an enormous error on his part. Now it was an issue of divine authority between the king and God. Now Elijah and the Israelites' job is to pray. 1 Timothy 2.1 First of all, then I urge that entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men. Now your job is to pray. Pray for peace and prosperity that would come from a different concept of government. 1 Peter 2.16 reminds us, act as free men. Do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. And of course, that takes you back to Galatians 1, 5, and 13. Christ has set us free for freedom. 1 Peter 3, 17. Th See, these are all talking about government. For it is better, if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right, rather than for what is wrong. Okay? Virus, drought, this is where we are. It's the, this, this virus is to bring a spiritual awakening into America. And listen, you're down to a vote as far as established government. And the rest of it is your walk with God. Listen, no matter how it goes, it doesn't change your walk with God. I'm trying to prepare you for that. You still have time to get out and make sure you're registered to vote. Make sure you understand what you're voting for, and when the time comes, stand in line and vote. And whatever the outcome is, you better get into Romans 13, 1 Peter 2, and 2 Timothy 2, because that's going to be your life. You need to understand it. Point number two. Yeah, all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to stay out ahead of the game. Here's a doctrinal principle. Here's what we learn. You learn it when you study the Bible. Whenever the government legislates evil against divine institutions and the divine agency, for us that would be the church, the divine agency, custodians of the word of God and evangelism, believers are left with the decision of how to oppose evil without opposing God's authority structure of chain of command. You've got to really be careful about that. Elijah is struggling with this doctrinal issue, with Ahab and Jezebel's influence for evil over him by the evil policies they've instituted. He must understand that God has a divine chain of command in every divine institution 
If it's freedom, it's volition. If it's employment, it's ownership management. If it's marriage, it's the husband. If it's family, it's parents. And if it's a nation, it's government. And it doesn't tell you what kind. Because God establishes them all. Do you understand that? Well, when you're looking at time period with Esther, you're looking at the 5th century B.C. When you get through with the period of Esther, then you're going to have Malachi. You're going to have the inner biblical period. See, we're right at the edge of that. And it helps you to understand some of that kind of stuff. Both kingdoms have gone. The north kingdom is going to fall in 722. The south kingdom is going to fall in 586. And we, and we, we, we have, we've gone from Babylonian captivity to the Persians. Here was Israel. They were under the Babylonians. Now they're under the Persians. They're going to go out from under the Persians to being under the Greeks. And then they're going to be under the Romans. And then, then, then comes the church. And the church is going to go through it. Until God gave us America. God gave us America. Do you understand that? Gave the church America. My, 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 what a wonderful day this is. And so when we're in, we're in Esther, we're in that period of the Persian rule. And uh, it's a wonderful study under Persian rule. That's a great book. It's a great book to study. Only two books in the only two books in the Bible named after women. And listen, these had to be some kind kind of women. You know what the other book is? Yeah, Ruth. Ruth. Well, it's it's all it's marvelous, marvelously interesting with them. And I I pulled out one verse. <laughs> that speaks about Esther. And it was a pivoting point in the book. Ten chapters, a pivoting point in chapter four with Esther. Really, really important. And here's what it says. Go assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa, that's the capital, and fast for me. He's, she's sending a letter back to Mordecai because <laughs> there is an edict out to destroy all the Jews. Mordecai says, you have the king's ear, and you need to speak. Now, the, the, she's going to have to climb out of her comfort zone big time. So you might as well get prepared to it, because it, uh, it's going to come to all of us. There is no comfort zone without God. And with God, it's always a comfort zone. So whatever your, whatever your little shy comfort zone is, you might as well get outside of it now while you have space and time to reflect and do. So she, go assemble all the Jews, she writes back, go and assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and my maidens will also fast in the same way. I and my maidens. And thus, I will go to the king which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. Is that putting it all on the line? Listen, that's putting it all on the line for God. She was so far out of her comfort zone. She was all in. She had all skin, we say. She had all the skin in the game. Listen, read chapter 10. Not now. There's not a person in here who can't read chapter 10. Listen, you could do this in the bathroom. And it's well worth your read, chapter 10, the way it closes the book. Another example of the same idea would be Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Also living for the Lord under foreign rule. I have to do what God tells me to do and take the heat for it. 
Look at Daniel. Hmm? Fiery furnace. All you say is, I had a professor. That's not true. That's mythology. That's, that's a fable. Wait till he comes to that fable in real time and ask him, what is it going to call it? When it comes to your life, what do you call it? Or the lion's den. See, for my professor, look at that's okay. If it's a metaphor, I think it's a real deal. But if you think it's a metaphor, when that metaphor knocks on your door and throws you into the lion's den, I'll come by and call it a fable. That <laughs> can't possibly, you can't possibly be in the lion's den. That's a fable. Listen, was a lion den a long way from a comfort zone? I tell you, I'd have run so many laps in that, in that. He'd eventually ate me because I ran out of sp speed and, and, and energy. I wouldn't have made it easy for him. That's hum the way humans think. Daniel didn't think that way. Daniel didn't think that way. Daniel didn't think that way. And when the lion, the first thing you know, the lions become a pet. Now, how does that happen? Did Daniel have the power to change the lion's heart? Who has power to do that in real-time life? I mean, who has the power to take the heart of a whale, the whole thinking process? I don't know what it is, but to take a whole thinking process of a whale, turn him around and pick up a, a prophet at the with seaweed wrapped around his head at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea and not eat him. You think how many times that whale must have really wrestled within himself. I want to eat him so bad. I want to eat him. I want him so bad. Are you sure he's worth this? I mean, I could do this so quick. Have a little... Compassion on this whale. I know. I, I, I'm screwy. I, th I see things that way. Point four. See, I'm telling you where you're going. Tell you where you're going. Point number four, as the prophet of the Lord God of Israel, Elijah was called to lead a spiritual reformation that could re reunite 12 tribes, 12 stones, into one priest nation of Israel, which was the 12 stones were the cross of Christ in shadow Christology. Elijah was called to be the spiritual spokesman for God to Israel, like John the Baptist, who was a type of the national prophet known as Elijah. A voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make straight the way of the Lord. As Elijah the prophet said in Isaiah 43. That's what a prophet does. He preaches the word of God. He warns and he encourages and he saves people. And destroy them. John 1.25 They asked him and said to him, why then are you baptizing if you're not the Christ, nor the Elijah, or the prophet? See, they were looking for Elijah to come back. This first century. Matthew 27, 46 and 47. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lala sabanaya. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But some of those who were standing at the cross, when they heard it, began to say, this man's calling for Elijah. Eli, Eli. They associated Elijah with the coming of Christ. Christ. 
it was believed that Elijah would suddenly return to the earth at the coming of Christ. This was shadowed in Matthew 17, 1 through 13, when Moses and Elijah met with Christ in what was called the transfiguration. It was a picture of the second coming of Christ. Elijah. See, what Elijah doesn't understand that day is God's bigger picture. Like many of you, you live in a snapshot rather than in the bigger picture. At some point in your Christian life, you've got to come out of the daily snapshot into the bigger picture. Of course you live your life in, in the daily snapshot. You need to get the bigger picture because God has given you a bigger picture of where you're going and what it's all about. It's my job to prepare you for that. And I'm preparing you today. God has a bigger picture and a bigger plan for Elijah in Messianic history than where he is today on Mount Carmel. Right? He's going to be connected with the coming of Christ, first coming, second coming. And his big feature is going to be the second coming of Christ. All the way from Mount Carmel, the, the, all the way to the second coming of Christ is where God has him pictured. You have no idea where God has you in biblical history because of Jesus Christ. You think, well, I, you know, nobody knows my address. I don't even give my phone number out. Eh, God knows everything. And listen, you have no idea where God is trying to push you and take you and develop your life. Listen. If you're a lady here today, you very well could be an Esther. But you have to prepare your life as if you are called to be an Esther. It takes preparation to be that when you can say, if I perish, I perish. And be content in your heart about it. The honor to serve God where you put all the skin in the game. She's so far out of her comfort zone, but God has prepared her for this moment. This is a great moment. Chapter 4. This is a 10-chapter book. God has called her up and into the motion The enemy is trying to destroy all of the Jews. All of the heritage of Christ. The devil is trying to destroy the coming of Christ. Very few of us understand how important our life is in Messianic history. God gives us a clue when he talks about crowns and rewards and eternity for your life in Christ on earth. They didn't get that in the Old Testament. Every person sat in this room can get crowns and, and, and rewards. Every one of you. And that's a bigger deal than you think it is. Your life has to be prepared. God has so much greater things than what you're dealing with. You're dealing with a snapshot. You got to get a, somewhere, you got to get a bigger picture. God has bigger plans for Elijah in Messianic history as a spiritual mature believer, Atelias. Elijah will be referenced in both the first and second coming of Christ. As soon as, soon as John shows up, everybody thinks Elijah's come. A voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord. They thought it was Elijah. Jesus comes and he, he preaches with this powerful message and he does miracles. They think Elijah's come. Jesus lets his inner disciples in on the transfiguration where they actually get a chance to meet with Moses, Elijah, and the Son of God most glorified. Your life connected with Christ is connected with Messianic history in a way you will never understand unless you put your head in the Word of God. God is preparing us for great ministry. You need to know where he's trying to push you, where he's trying to move you.
this election is a Mark Carmel. This election is a Mount Carmel deal. You need to be praying for it. You need to prepare yourself for it. Either way it goes, God wants a reformation. Either way it goes, he wants a reformation. There's got to become a spiritual awakening. The church is sound asleep with the world under its wheels. Let me give you an example and I'll close. When's the last time you talked to somebody face-to-face seriously about their need of salvation in Christ. I'm so thankful that one day in my life a person did that even though I didn't like it and even though I rebelled against it the seed was sown clear gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish. Ron, you're perishing. And today you can have eternal life if you believe that Jesus came and died on the cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. The day you believe it, you will be removed from perishing, going to hell, eternal life going to heaven. Yeah. Talking to me about the, the line between submitting to a, a government and then just just like the rest of us. So what's the line? Well, the line is that when you go against authority, right? The authority is going to respond in the way they respond. Well, when is that the right thing? Well, the right thing is always what, what when the will of God does it. Listen, they all whether it's Esther or Daniel, or the early disciples. Listen, Peter did what the average Christian would do when authority got a hold of them and the plan of God says, I want this done. When they came to arrest Jesus, what did Peter do? He pulled out his sword. Listen, he pulled out his sword. What did Jesus tell him to do? Put it back in. And the reason he told him to put it back in is because, listen, Peter, you once again are not paying attention to the bigger picture of what God is trying to do. Right? Grab the wrong weapon. Well, yeah, you should have grabbed the, the sword was right, but it should have been the sword of the word of God. Listen, you know when you're doing the right thing. Because, listen, listen, God didn't send us into the world to destroy the world. He sent us, listen, God, God, God's, God's got all of that. He sent us in the world to redeem it. The church is all about redemption. The person you want to kill, you should sit down with and share the gospel and get them saved. We are, listen, every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're a custodian of the word of God and evangelism. That's our mission in the world. We change the world one person at a time with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It changed my life. I mean, the word, the gospel and the word of God has changed my life. And it will, and it, listen, it's changed yours and it should be changing yours. From the gospel is the word of God and the word of God brings you into the, into the confirmation that you belong to Christ, that you, you belong to Christ. Nobody has power over your life that God doesn't sign off on, Al, right? Nobody has power over your life that God doesn't sign off on. Nobody. Nobody in this world is greater than the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead, who lives in your life. Nobody has that authority that God doesn't sign off on. Nobody. I belong to God. I've been sealed under the day of redemption. Nobody has power over my life but God alone. Whatever he signs off for, I, want, I march it out.
Listen, Paul, the only way they could keep Paul from preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ was cut, the, cut his head off. They cut his head off with divine permission. Father, we're so thankful today. The church of Jesus Christ, what is their role? Military? No. That's divine institution, government. Tanks and bombs and bullets? No. The sword, the word of God. The sword. Put the full armor of God on. You want to be a warrior? You want to be a soldier? Put the word of God on your life and live it out. Take the heat for it. Draw the sword. Not, not the physical weapon, the spiritual weapon that can change a person's life. The word of God that can drive down to the depths of a man's soul and become a critic in thoughts of the intentions of his heart. Oh God, what is wrong with us? We are the church of Jesus Christ. It cannot be removed from the earth until the second coming of Christ. Don't let man change his father. Don't let man change his nor fear. We're people of faith. And faith always wins. Faith is a victory that overcomes the world. May we never forget it in Jesus' name. Amen.